so it is 5.39 in the evening and I'm starting this vlog here. Uh, so I'm preparing my third meal of the day, uh, which is some lean ground beef fried up with some rice. It's a half a packet of pre-packaged rice, um, roughly 200 calories. And I'm going to mix that together in a chipotle bowl with romaine lettuce and what's left of this kale mix. And then add sour cream and, and salsa. So guys, this is what the finished product looks like. It's a pretty decent sized bowl. So I'm gonna eat that, and then I'm going to get ready for uh, the podcast I'm about to record. Um, so I'm about to do an episode with Lyle McDonald. Six and a half hours later. Long ago, finished up a two and a half hour uh, interview with Lyle McDonald. Um, I think it went really, really well. Had a bit of a sporadic day, so that's one of the benefits of intuitive eating, is that if you happen to fall behind a little bit, then you can sort of catch up a little bit uh, as far as, as fat loss goes and not even notice it. Uh, whereas when you're tracking, uh, you'd have to more or less stuff your face at the end of the night just to hit your macros. Uh, that is, I think, one of the main advantages. Uh, so today my caloric intake was probably lower than on um, other days just because I was super busy and my mind was occupied and everything. Uh, so I just didn't eat as much. So tomorrow's a leg day and I'll keep you guys posted uh, with some training clips from that tomorrow. Okay everyone, so I'm back with the following day's leg session. Um, so this was actually my first leg workout back after my deload. Uh, so I actually ended up taking almost two full weeks off. It was more something like 10 or 12 days uh, without squatting. Um, so on the couple of leg days that I did in that period, uh, I just leg pressed uh, with some fairly low loads, fairly low RPE. Um, so this was my first workout back. And as you guys would have just seen, um, that warm-up set with 315 was moving really fast. Uh, the weights were feeling really good. I didn't really feel out of my groove at all with squatting um, because you know what, after so many years of training, uh, the skill really becomes something that's ingrained. You know, it's like riding a bike. You don't really forget how to do it. Um, so taking a couple weeks or even a couple of months off of training every once in a while uh, is probably not the worst idea in the world. Um, and I was basically right back to it here. Uh, so 365 was my first working set. Um, and I actually did an ascending pyramid on this day. Uh, so I started with 365. That moved pretty quickly for a set of five. Uh, so I added 20 pounds, went up to 385, uh, and did that for another set of five. Um, and this isn't a set structure that I typically use. I typically just do straight sets for the most part. Uh, at a given percentage of my one rep max. Um, however, on this day, uh, I, where I was just getting back into the squats, I wasn't exactly sure where my strength levels would be at. Um, so I used the ascending pyramid uh, just for me to kind of gauge how it is my strength was doing on that day and based subsequent sets off of how the previous sets felt. Um, and I actually think that this is a, a method that I might continue to employ. Um, a few other coaches that I've talked to seem to have had some success with this. Uh, so basically what you would do is set a low end uh, uh, percent 1RM prescription uh, for that day. And then based on how that feels, you can have um, increases according to uh, you know, how, that, how the weight feels basically. Um, so on this day, I went up to 405. You guys will see here that I am using the low bar position. This is something that I've started doing again. Uh, one, just because I'm stronger with this position, I would say about five to 7% um, stronger here uh, than with high bar. And also I just feel like I'm able to feel it in my glutes a little bit more, um, even though the EMG research doesn't show a whole lot of a difference between 
high bar squats and low bar squats overall in terms of glute activation. Um, I personally do definitely feel a difference and I think that uh, that stands for something. Um, so what's up next guys is a couple sets of uh, RDLs. I apologize for the poor footage. I didn't realize until after the filming was done that I had the camera setting on aperture priority, uh, which is basically used for stuff that's moving at really slow speeds. Uh, so the footage looks really choppy and kind of weird, um, <laughs> but I'll talk you guys through it anyway. Uh, so here's a set with 275. Um, the main two things you wanna keep in mind with RDLs are to set your hips back and keep the bar path straight up and down, just like a conventional deadlift over the, the middle of the foot. Um, and keep a slight arch in your lower back and uh, don't keep your knees locked, uh, but at the same time, don't allow the knees to flex too, too much. Um, so uh, you wanna be able to feel a stretch in the hamstrings uh, at the bottom of the movement. And I tend to go with Brett Contreras' recommendation of ending the range of motion of the eccentric at uh, just below the knee. Uh, people who ha have pretty um, flexible uh, hamstrings or people like me who have super short femurs, uh, you might want to go a little bit lower than that, uh, but for the most part, probably no lower than to mid shin level. Uh, so after that, it was on to a knee flexion based hamstring movement. Uh, so to hit the hamstrings, I think most effectively, you should be including both a hip extension based movement, uh, like a Romanian deadlift, um, and a knee flexion based movement, uh, so like a leg curl. In this case, we were doing uh, kneeling leg curls. Um, and one of the things I wanna draw your guys' attention to is the cheating that I just did there as the weight got too heavy. So I actually slowed it down in slow motion for you guys. And you'll see what I do. And this is super common. My hips just pop up. And what this allows me to do is it basically causes my like triceps and chest muscles to just push the weight up. So I actually lift my hips up off of the machine and this just sort of like jerks the weight up and takes my hamstring more or less out of it. Um, and this is just your body's way of basically making the movement easier for you uh, so that you can complete it. Um, and I don't think that this is a good thing. Uh, so you will see that after this set, I did uh, drop the weight back. Um, and one of the things I've really been focusing on with my hamstrings is keeping my legs and hips pinned to the machine. So in this case, it's the kneeling leg curl. The same thing would apply on the lying leg curl um, and really forcing the hamstring to do the work instead of you know any of the other muscles like the glutes or <laughs> in the case of the kneeling curl, like the triceps and chest. Uh, so then it was on to leg extensions. Uh, for these, um, I would say the best tip that I would have uh, would be to uh, keep your butt planted. Um, so you see me grabbing onto the side of the seat there. Um, basically what I'm doing here is pulling my butt down uh, because your butt tends to rise here, which reduces the range of motion at the knee. Uh, so you don't have to, uh, you don't have quite as much knee flexion at the bottom because your butt is kind of popped up. Uh, so obviously that would be <laughs> not the smartest way to train the quads. Um, so try to keep your butt down as far as toe position goes, um, I generally just make the recommendation to point them uh, in a direction that feels most comfortable to you. Um, there is some research to indicate that pointing the toe slightly in, which I think you can see me doing there, uh, will hit the outer sweep, so the vastus lateralis, a little bit more. Um, but I don't think it's significant enough to do it if it feels uncomfortable to you. Um, so uh, as a matter of toes, just point them where you feel the quads working the most or what feels most comfortable. Uh, so then we finish off with some cable pull-throughs. Uh, so this is sort of like one of the, the metabolic stress components of my glute training. Uh, so I find that I really can feel a good uh, quote unquote burn in the glutes with this movement. Um, and so I like to hit it in the higher rep ranges. I'll go as high as 20 to 25 reps uh, on these. And I think it's important to really get a full range of motion. So you want to flex at the hips until your uh, back is more or less parallel with the floor and then come up and squeeze the glutes hard at the top. Uh, one of the things that I 
kind of catch myself doing or I see other people doing with this movement is they allow the handles of the rope to rest on their quads. Um, and this completely takes the tensions off, tension off of the glutes at the top um, when they're firing the hardest. Uh, so you really wanna kind of keep um, keep the, the handles away from your quads because if they're resting there, then like I said, there's no tension anymore. Um, so what I do to do this is I sort of do activate my shoulders uh, a little bit um, and keep the, the rope sort of out in front of me um, as I do the pull through and then I squeeze the glutes hard at the top. Okay guys, so that's gonna conclude this commentary and I hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of the vlog. Here, getting some post workout. Is there anything? Is there any other? Yeah, you can deal? use ten percent off and ten percent off. Okay, we'll just get the large and use that then. Richard, would you like everything on that? Yes, please. Sure, you go. Good. Thank you. All right, thanks, sir. So cold, so sweet, so bad. Okay guys, that's going to conclude this vlog. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one.